if men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and, in the next place, oblige it to govern itself. The words of James Madison, from Federalist 51. Just like he told us earlier with the beacon lights, we're walking through a minefield here. On one side, we have the landmines of a government that can't govern its people. On the other, a government that can't constrain itself. And we're left trying to split the gap. It's kind of a poorly laid out minefield with a path in the middle, but whatever. We've got to establish a government that can do both, control its populace, and keep its power in check. The last chapter about the framing of the Constitution was about creating a national government that could rule more effectively than the Articles government. This chapter we start to look at how that government governs itself. If men were angels, none of this would be necessary, but given that we know that not to be the case, let's take a look at how our government protects against governmental abuse. One of the two ways in which our government does this is through the Montesquieu-styled system of checks and balances and the separation of powers. You've had these terms since elementary school social studies classes, so I expect you to be familiar with them, but I will remind you that you're going to need to know the checks and balances described in this chart seen in your, from your textbook. The purpose of this video isn't just to read things to you that you already know, though. The purpose of the video is to go deeper. So we're going to take a closer look at three of the most noteworthy checks and balances today. The veto, a check that the executive holds over the legislature. Impeachment, a check that the legislature holds over the other branches. And the big old hammer of judicial review, the power that makes the SCOTUS a powerful institution. Let's start ourselves off with the veto. We have the description provided by Article 1 of the Constitution here telling us that every bill which shall have passed the House of Representatives and the Senate shall, before it become a law, be presented to the President of the United States. If he approve, he shall sign it, but if not, he shall return it with his objections to that House in which it shall have originated, who will reconsider it. If, after such reconsideration, two-thirds of that House shall agree to pass the bill, it shall be sent, together with the objections, to the other House, but which it shall likewise, by which it shall likewise be reconsidered, and, if approved by two-thirds of that House, it shall become a law. So if the President vetoes a bill, the House in which that bill originated can bring it back up again, which we would assume they would do because presumably they took the time and effort to pass it in the first place and came to the consensus that this concept, this bill, should become law. It would stand to reason to us that their opinion of the bill has not changed just because of the president's veto. But what we'll actually find is that looking at the data creates a strange and different picture. The veto itself is not rare. If we look at the, how often it has been used in the modern era since World War II, it's been used a good 795 times. And yet, when it comes time to override the president's veto, only 135 times during that time period has Congress even attempted to override the president's veto. Most of the time, six times out of seven, when the president says no, Congress ends up dropping the issue. This is odd when, again, we remember that most of Congress approves of the measure. By definition, they passed it. So why is it that overrides of the president's veto are rare? Well, a few reasons. One is that the president tends to be very picky, or any president tends to be very picky, about what they choose to veto. The key to, the veto, to veto politics is the perception of the president's power. If you veto a bill and kill it, you're the most powerful figure in the U.S. government, but if you veto a bill and Congress passes it over your head, you've been completely undercut as president, completely undercut as the executive. As a result, presidents try to time their vetoes for times when they feel that they have a likely chance of actually winning, 
or for times when they feel like they w could possibly win by losing, that their issue is important enough to part of their base that the base will admire them for fighting the good fight. So presumably one of the reasons why we see this huge gap between the number of vetoes and then the number of override attempts is because the president has already considered whether or not it's possible to override that bill and likely won't even attempt a veto if he feels that there's a possibility that it will be overridden. If they're vetoing a bill, they're pretty confident that a two-thirds majority, that two-thirds majority that the Constitution requires to override a veto, doesn't exist. The other part of it being the a question of the president's power is that Congress doesn't want to be seen as taking on the president in the court of public opinion because if they do, they know that they will usually lose. While our president's approval ratings tend to hover right around 50%, Congress's approval ratings hover somewhere around 10%. The Ebola virus is more popular. Congress knows that if there's a showdown over a veto, that they're likely to be defeated by the public president's publicity team, no matter who the president happens to be at the time. The third reason, though, why we see so few veto override attempts? Well, because they're usually fool's errands of only about a third of them actually succeed, and that's because it's hard to find anything that two-thirds of the Congress will unify on. Veto overrides are tough, which means that the president's veto, assuming that it is properly used and judiciously used by the president, tends to be a pretty powerful and pretty definitive power. Only about one time in 16 is the veto actually overridden, so the presidential veto really is the power to say no most of the time in American politics. Our second check is the power of impeachment. It's an important one for us to understand, even if it is very rarely used. Impeachment is a two-step process, with the first step belonging to the U.S. House of Representatives. The House Keep in mind that the House was des designed to be the direct representatives of the people under the original text of the Constitution as opposed to the Senate, an agency of the states. The House has the power to impeach any officer, not just the president, but really anyone who is an official of the U.S. federal government, including Supreme Court justices and federal judges who would otherwise serve for life. The House has the ability to impeach them by a simple majority vote. Now, we know that this has happened twice to presidents in our history, hello, although neither one was removed from office, which brings us to the second step of the impeachment process. Goodbye. The Senate trial. The Senate is given the task of trying the impeachment and either upholding the conviction as being enough to remove the person from office or to acquit them. One of the reasons that both presidents were spared here is because of the decisiveness rules of the Senate. While it only takes a majority of the House to impeach, it takes a two-thirds supermajority of the U.S. Senate to remove from office. As we said on the last slide, two-thirds is a pretty large consensus to be building. As an extra little, uh, yeah, you'll need to pause there. As an extra bit of information, we see a strange overlap of the branches here as impeachment trials call for the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court to preside over the Senate during the trial. His role after he takes his seat in the front is slightly ambiguous and ill-defined given how rarely this happens, but we see just another example of powers being separate and, at the same time, intertwined with each other. The impeachment process can become one that is about petty political rivalries more than it is about crimes and misdemeanors, but it's worth noting that as often as impeachment is thrown out of, as a threat simply for a president who is unpopular or for an official who is unpopular and demagogued by the other party, regardless of who the president or the other party is, it's worth noting that the way the decisiveness rules are set up and the presence of a neutral arbiter in that chief justice make it so that impeachment as pure political theater or as the product of rivalries and political disagreements is highly unlikely. It's a way that we ensure that the removal of a tyrannical or corrupt leader is done systematically. 
After all, at the Constitutional Convention, no less of a voice than Benjamin Franklin's said that if we didn't have such a mechanism, that we would need to worry about our leaders being removed, not systematically, but asystematically. And then we get to our third hammer, the power of judicial review. Explaining the power to us, we get Alexander Hamilton writing in the Federalist Papers, one of my favorites and one that we will look at in class when we get to the court section, Fed 78. There is, there is no position which depends on clearer principles than that every act of a delegated authority contrary to the tenor of the commission under which it is exercised is void. No legislative act, therefore, contrary to the Constitution, can be valid. To deny this would be to affirm that the deputy is greater than his principal, that the servant is above his master, that the representatives of the people are superior to the people themselves, that men acting by virtue of powers may do not only what their powers do authorize, but what they forbid. Hamilton from Fed 78. In short, if any act violates the Constitution, the document which gives governments legitimate authority, it is illegitimate and therefore it needs to be ignored. We'll ignore ourselves for a moment that this comes from a guy who completely ignored the Articles of Confederation's amendment process because they were an inconvenience to his goal of a strong national government. Whatever, Hamilton, never change. A few things that are important here, though. Oftentimes, we get this reimagined history where a judicial review, the power of the Supreme Court to invalidate the actions of another branch of government if they are found to be in violation of the Constitution, was introduced out of the blue in the case of Marbury versus Madison. That's not true, as I'm sure you learned in U.S. history. The power had already been in the United States before, in particular, it had been used in Rhode Island, where the courts overturned their little currency printing escapade that nearly tanked the economy in the 1780s. Hamilton and Rhode Island were really hitting on all my favorites on this slide, aren't we? Ugh. But more importantly, legal scholars knew and understood the doctrine. It's there in the Federalist Papers well before the case of Marbury versus Madison. There was precedence for it in the Rhode Island case. As Hamilton explained here, there was no clearer principle to him than the idea that if something violates the Constitution, it is therefore invalid. So when we say that judicial review doesn't appear in the Constitution, Hamilton, Hamilton would respond to us by saying, sure it does. It's inherent in that supremacy clause in Article 6. If the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, any action contrary to it is inherently invalid. You should already be familiar with the concept of judicial review from U.S. history, but what I wanted to point out here is that the power is much older and much clearer than we tend to think and label it. Our three... Those are three of our major checks and balances. See your textbook for more, know them, and love them. But we do ourselves a disservice to label checks and balances as being only between the three branches of the federal government. Indeed, our biggest check on tyranny is that the U.S. Constitution kept our state governments intact. Our state governments not only retain a good deal of power, but they have the ability to shape the national government through the amendment process. How we have a system that has both one unified nation and 50 sovereign nations in the states this is a notion that would baffle your typical Chinese or Russian political theorists, where they exist in a mostly unitary system, even though they do have a few autonomous regions. For the most part, you are dealing with a unified government there. How we have this system of one nation and 50 states simultaneously is the main topic of this chapter. How does this protect us from tyranny? So glad you asked. Complex government makes tyranny less likely. If your system of government includes not only three branches of government at the national level, but 50 autonomously functioning state governments, it's going to be hard to create truly tyrannical policy. There are enough vehicles, as we've already shown, to override tyranny at the national level, and at the state level can be as simple as states won't be able to have policies that are too far out of line with citizen expectations when those citizens have 49 other state options. Small example, North Carolina bans certain types of fireworks, so citizens of North Carolina purchase them in South Carolina. 
in a larger scale example, you can look at how businesses can sometimes choose a location for their corporate headquarters based on state tax laws. Having a federal system in which states retain autonomy makes it so that perceived oppression is often escapable and it gives citizens the ability to have a redress of their perceived oppressions from another state. Another important aspect to always keep in mind about our federal system is that the states are the deciders when it comes to amending the plan for the national government, the U.S. Constitution. Giving the states the power to amend the supreme law of the land means that the ultimate power with the U.S. national government rests not with any national official, but an uncoordinated combination of 50 different legislative bodies. If any nefarious interest group wants to take control of the national government, truly what they would need to do is coordinate all 50 of those state legislatures, and good luck to them. And up until a point in our history, our states also played a very important role in even the national lawmaking process. Bear in mind that prior to the passage of the 17th Amendment, states directly controlled half of Congress by appointing the senators. Prior to the 17th Amendment, any national piece of legislation had to be a joint effort between the elected representatives of the citizens, the House of Representatives, and the chosen representatives of the states, the Senate. States matter, and they matter greatly in our system. They'll be the main topic of our conversation throughout Chapter 3, and starting tomorrow we'll take a look at some of the dilemmas and protections that are brought on by our federal system. Until then, young political scientists.